killing sharks sells, right? Yeah. But what it's led to is basically this blinding fear where people don't care that they're being wiped out, and yet people do rely on them. They just don't realize it yet. Welcome to this week's episode. We have Ocean Ramsey and Juan. And I'm so excited to see you here on the north coast of Hawaii. I'm visiting, but you live here, you're from here. And uh, welcome I- Welcome and thanks for having us. Oh, yeah, yeah very, very welcome, yeah. Tell me about yourself, Ocean. What's yeah. your avocation, vocation, passion? Uh, I'm a shark and marine conservationist yep. and a marine biologist. Okay. And uh, my master's is in ethology, which is animal behavior and psychology. And I studied specifics on shark behavior and body language. And I specifically looked at how we could utilize this information to avoid adverse interactions. So it has a practical application for society in general. Um, but a big part of what we do is trying to help people to overcome the misperceptions that the media generally kind of portrays about sharks and, and actually working with Juan as a, as a photographer, a videographer, as an artist, um, he's actually been able to capture people's attention through captivating imagery um, in order to educate them on the importance of sharks and that's something that a lot of people don't realize. I did two years studying human psychology and a lot of people kind of don't think of themselves as animals, but yeah. since we don't speak the same language. Can I tell you some of my problems? Language. I got some sure. problems. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> go for it, go for it. Actually, if you want to be nervous about people, study psychology. Yeah. Um, but by studying human psychology, humans are animals too. Do you think sharks have any sense of the future? Mm, I think that they're kind of the most beautiful epitome of evolutionary perfection. And I think that they're constantly adapting to their environment. And that's one of the most incredible things I think about them is that they have an evolutionary history of over 450 million years. Humans have been evolving for only 200,000. So they're at this perfect balance in the marine ecosystem. But the unfortunate thing is, is you know, 450 million years, and it's just now, this point in time, which is, you know, during my lifetime is kind of shocking that so many of them are approaching that extinction level. Right, right. Megalodons disappeared about three million years ago. I'm always amazed at how many megalodon shark teeth there are around. Yeah, so that's, matter, that's actually one of the only things that survives. They naturally lose their teeth. Sharks naturally lose their teeth. Um, and, and because of the calcium, they, they survive. So you can find these fossils all around the world, which is part of the reason that we know they have such a long evolutionary history. Do you know what did in megalodons? Um, mm. I think there's a couple absence different of different theories. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the absence of prey. I think that Again, besides not my, whales, yeah, I yeah, not yeah. my specialty. Because <laughs> they just, because they just kind of disappeared, like three million, and there was a lot of them. You think about like the average shark loses about ten thousand teeth in a lifespan. So yeah. I mean, even though you're thinking you're finding thousands and thousands of teeth, it might not have been that many as a population. Right. right. You know? And they're slow to reproduce too, which makes I'd be say hesitant to say the population was super robust. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, although, but like you mentioned, like yeah. five major mass extinctions usually due to environmental conditions, and we're studying environmental conditions and how they relate to animal behavior. The shark population decline isn't due to environmental conditions per se. What we can actually directly attribute it to is overfishing and targeted fishing. So there's something called shark fin soup. Yeah. It's a status symbol bowl of soup. It's served in Asia and the demand for it because China has the largest population of people on the planet. The demand for it is so high that at the rate that they're fishing them to supply the fins for shark fin soup, the populations just can't keep up because they're apex predators, which means that they're generally slow to reproduce. They reach sexual maturity late in life and they have long gestation periods. Right. So with people wanting to, I need a shark fin for the shark fin soup for the wedding, the banquet, the business meeting, and you know, you're know you talking about the largest population of people on the planet, sharks just can't keep up with that. And the other sad thing, I mean, for somebody that's grown up spending so much time with sharks is to see them killed for less than 5% of their body. It's a waste and it's just a status symbol. I know, symbol. it's tragic, isn't it? Yeah, it, it doesn't is. doesn't even taste very good, I've heard. Yeah, yeah it's, it's they right. actually- And it's toxic. It's, it's yeah. kind of madness. It's toxic? It, it, yeah, the, the methyl mercury in it is like stronger in the cartilage than it is in any part of the tissue. Oh, I so. didn't know that. And okay. there's other toxins too, neurotoxins. Yeah. It's just, it's kind of like a, a madness thing that you're consuming something and you're wasting your resource and yet it's poisonous to you as well. Yeah. So, you know, why haven't they changed much? I mean, it's almost like we're swimming with a living fossil in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, actually mm -hmm. when we dive with great whites and we see them as close as you and I are, it literally is. It's like that movie Jurassic Park and you're like, wow, this is a real life dinosaur. And they swim by and they lock eyes with you and like if you're in a cage, they still see you through the cage. They're quite intelligent and I think a lot of people don't realize that. But there's over 400 
different species of sharks, and so you'll have you know different degrees and level of cognition. Since you're a, a, a psychologist for sharks, you know, they talk about their problems with you, right? Yeah. I got an image problem. I, 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 just, I just feel like everybody's afraid of me. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> when I go to a party, no one wants to talk to me. You know, <laughs> what, know. what is it? No, what, no that's what? actually the sad thing is that they can't speak uh, up for themselves, right? Yeah. So the way that they're portrayed in the media, generally people have this idea that they're like that movie Jaws, which is completely fictitious in Hollywood. Um, but to see them, you know, eye to eye, face to face, to spend so much time in the water with them almost every single day, studying their behavior, their communication, their social hierarchy. Describe to me some of the dimensions of their intelligence. So they can learn and adapt in a relatively short period of time. And when I say they, um, really I would have to go into species specifics yeah. because if you compare a white shark with a blue shark, well, you wouldn't really. Right. I mean, the way that they predate even isn't the same. Um, but I've observed white sharks regularly outsmarting humans. And you have to figure they are smart enough that it's so rare that they make a mistake. I mean, how often do you make a mistake in your life, right? Every day. Right. With tagging information, we can see that white sharks and tiger sharks swim past surfers, swimmers, and divers all day, every day. And it's so rare that they mistake them as a potential prey item. Right. Um, and yet, they are such efficient apex predators. Trust me, if they wanted to eat you, they could. And they don't get the credit they deserve for that and the intelligence that it takes and also because of their extra sensory systems. So they actually have continued to evolve over the last 450 million years, even though they may physically, exterior wise, look more or less about the same, but they actually have extra sensory systems like the ampullae of Lorenzini where they can feel the electrical impulse that every yeah. living organism puts out or the lateral line and they can actually navigate like transoceanic voyages and all this other stuff. So it's pretty impressive that even in bad visibility, even when a surfer resembles a seal-like silhouette, something that looks like prey, and is thrashing around or splashing around like an injured animal, that it's so rare that they will actually go up and bump and or bite. Right. It's actually less than 10 human fatalities worldwide annually. That's the entire world, an entire year. Less than 10 human fatalities. Do you know how many sharks are killed by humans every year? About 100 million. Yeah, yeah 70 to 100 million. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's crazy. Everything kills people more than sharks. But yeah, yeah. sharks are the monsters, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jellyfish, no, there. 40 Jellyfish. plus people drowning in the U.S. alone. Selfies. It's over 350,000. Kill more people. Now, in 2018, yeah. it's not even I over. Think I, I think the best statistic I heard is more people die falling off toilet seats yeah. than, yeah. than they do getting Slipping eaten by sharks. Slipping in the bathtub, falling out of bed. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. Electric yeah. Electric I always wondered, though, if those statistics have, have ever been corrected for people that are actually swimming in areas where there are sharks. Well, if you think about just jellyfish and drownings. Mm -hmm. I mean, drownings in the U.S. alone, 350,000, right? Yep. Just jellyfish, 40. So with sharks, it's less than 10. Right. So if you think about just even those things, or you could think about like coconuts kill more people or tripping over sandcastles. So just like beach and ocean going activities. Mm -hmm. So their, their sensory ability is extraordinary. Is that the measure of intelligence that you're referring to when yeah. you say they're smart? I'm saying like, uh, let's say that you put a human on a boat and you put a string and you put a piece of fish off the back, right? And then you tell the person that when the, the great white shark, white shark swims by, yeah. um, make sure and pull the line so that the shark doesn't get the fish, right? right? So you would think it'd be a really simple thing. The person just watches the fish, right, and pulls it away. But what'll happen is that the white shark will adapt and find a blind spot and change its timing. It'll even change its behavior. It'll even act like it's not interested. Really? It'll go away, it'll use the shadows, it'll try from different angles and different speeds until it successfully predates on it. And it'll do this in a short period of time. And I mean, that's kind of outsmarting the human. Well, I will even like go at it the same exact like approach every, like three or four times in a row and then the the one that they're going to put all their effort in is the one after they've got the human used to pulling it, pulling it, and they'll come from underneath the cage and go straight at it and get it. And it's so they're like, adapting it. They're watching yeah. how fast the person's retracting the line mm -hmm. and what is what is their response time. So then you see the human try and, try and adapt to that. Yeah. Uh, but invariably the white shark wins. Yeah. And yeah. I've been out with them like without the use of a cage and uh, they use almost like a distraction technique. So you'll be looking at a shark in front of you and then I don't know if they can communicate to each other. We don't have this proven yet, right? But it seems like they'll try and cut off your exit 
and they'll come from alternate directions. And I see this all the time with tiger sharks, um, where you'll watch them and they'll swim out of your peripheral in one direction, and then they'll literally go up current, or they'll go with the sun, because mammals have a tendency not to look into the sun, um, to have that advantage to come up. And it's not necessarily to predate, and that's a big mistake for people to think that a shark is approaching someone just for predation. Right. Sometimes it's genuinely curiosity. And depending on your behavior, they may approach you as another predator who is in their territory, which could be a territorial confrontation, surely out of curiosity because they don't normally recognize or see something right. that looks like us in their territory. Um, but if it is from behind, there is the potential that they could be approaching you as a potential prey item. And that's why it's important to adapt your behavior to their behavior. So when you're in the ocean, you're in their home, and you should adapt to their ecological role right. because we actually need them to function as apex predators in the marine ecosystem because you like to breathe, right? Yeah. 70% okay. of the air that you breathe comes from the oceans and sharks are a vital component to that healthy marine ecosystem. I'm with you there. I feel like you're an ambassador for the sharks. You know? Growing up with the sharks, I, I feel bad that they can't speak up for themselves and, and to watch the way that they're portrayed in media, which is so false and, and skewed and, you know, people well, let's say demonizing sharks sells, right? Yeah. And so it's very easy to demonize them. And so you see that just over and over again. But what it's led to is basically this blinding fear where people don't care that they're being wiped out. And yet people do rely on them. They just don't realize it yet because fear is very blinding. And I don't think that we're separate from animals. Humans are animals as well. That was part of studying psychology because I can't speak shark language, but yeah. I can talk to another human. Yeah. So ethology, animal behavior, and psychology. So you just study another animal, another human. And how did you start off with this ocean? What got you going so passionately and so? I think I grew up in the water. My parents, obviously, they love the ocean, obviously. Yeah. They're swimmers and divers. And I just grew up with sharks, and I got to experience what they were really like. And they're one of the most incredible, incredible animals on the planet, I think. They have such a unique presence, and I've been swimming with pretty much every animal that swims in the ocean. And it's just, it's really sad to me to watch them over the course of my lifetime since I was a kid. Just every place that I go around the world, I see fewer and fewer and fewer sharks, more and more plastic, more and more fishing line, more and more humans and more and more humans that don't care. And so I'm trying to help people to overcome fear, to open their eyes to the importance of sharks and, and really actually the beauty as well, because it's, such an incredible experience to go out and spend time with them and they really are such polite predators there's not too many apex predators that you can just kind of cruise up next to and of course do it respectfully and i hope you're going to join us out tomorrow and i'd like to yeah, yeah. tomorrow morning you'll get yeah. to experience this for yourself are there any behaviors that that we should be concerned about well they are apex predators so their ecological role is to pick off the dead dying weak sick injured animals right that's their whole ecological role that's why we actually need them we need predators they're right. the ones that keep disease from spreading they keep lower trophic level populations healthy and in balance so the difference comes is when you adopt your behavior to appear to be more like a healthy animal a predator rather than a potential prey item now we both surf so of course as surfers eyes aren't in the water we're splashing on the surface we're kind right. of mimicking a potential prey item right? Right, right a lot of what we're doing is mimicking a potential prey item but here's the thing is like we go in the water we choose to go surfing we're playing in their front yard like we accept that we're acting and behaving this way and we accept the consequences of that fully and consciously. It's just like, if you were to dress up as a zebra and go play soccer in front of a bunch of lions and then the lion attacked you, are you gonna go kill all the lions? No, right. I mean, hopefully you wouldn't, right? right? Yeah. Because you need lions to keep those wildebeest zebra populations healthy and in balance. Because if you kill all the lions, what happens to the zebra population? They explode explode yeah. and then they overgraze and then disease spreads and they end up you know. We learned that with wolves, didn't we? I yeah, love that. how when wolves Bach change rivers. rivers. Yeah. When the wolves okay. were, and we've got too many chickens here in Hawaii, too. <laughs> 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 um, no, like our listeners are going to have to deal with that. We're out in the beautiful outdoors here. and mm -hmm. I don't uh, even notice it. It's like we yeah, have more chickens than yeah. people. We've, we've yeah. sort of gone with the flow on this, on this today. But, but that's an interesting perspective, too. You're like, oh, we have too many chickens. It's like, you could say we have too many humans or too much plastic. It's like the, the issues in the world and stuff like that, it's not like okay, a shark is eating a human, that's such a rare, rare thing. It's like, well, what about what the humans are doing to their environment? Some are territorial, right? Some species can be territorial. Which ones? 
Um, the bull shark has the most testosterone of any animal on the planet. Really? So it can be a little bit more territorial. The Galapagos that hopefully you'll swim with me with tomorrow, can, they're a relative of the bull shark. They can be a little territorial, um, but so can your dog and, and so can humans. Humans can be territorial as well. And what are some of the behaviors that, that, that a shark might display that you as a specialist would say, oh, okay, that's that's something I'm going to respect and I'm going to be, be yeah. careful of. What, what? That's a great question. Yeah. So it's called agonistic or territorial body language. And so they'll do threat displays or exaggerate their natural swimming patterns and movements. Um, a really, really basic one is called gill popping. And so a lot of species will swim with their mouths slightly agape in order to pass water over their gills. And so if you get frustrated with someone, hopefully you don't just walk up and like punch them, right? Yeah. Sharks are like that. They yeah. don't just walk up and punch. They maybe take a deep breath first, right? And they fluff their gills out. And that is called ram ventilation. So they might be forcing water across their gills, okay. right? In order to oxygenate either out of frustration or potentially because they're getting ready to maybe fight, right? If you were right. going to get in a fight, you'd probably start breathing a little bit more. So we're very sensitive to watching that. Another one is parallel swimming. So this is a swimming pattern. That's when two sharks swim either nose to nose or nose to tail. And what they're doing is they're sizing each other up because they like to keep a social hierarchy. This helps them to avoid physical confrontation. And so generally the larger shark will stay, but there are exceptions to this and it depends on the species. Um, it depends on if a shark has very heavy scarring. It even depends on the individual. And that's the really cool thing about sharks is just like you and I, yeah. every single one is unique and individual and different. And we can use the term unique disposition or temperament, mm -hmm. um, or some people use the term personality. So it depends on the shark. But social hierarchy is something that all animals have. And so sharks maintain a social hierarchy through this agonistic territorial body language, specific threat displays, or specific swimming patterns. Have you gotten to know any sharks individually? A lot, and they're amazing. Tell and that's part that. of the reason why I do what I do, yeah. is because getting to know like a tiger shark, like Curly Girl or Roxy. Um, okay, so these are sharks you've seen more than once? A Over lot. Over 10 years, yeah. 12 years. Really? Over yeah. 15 years, yeah. probably. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Well, tell, me about one of the, tell me about one of them. Like when oh, you yeah. first met and what the circumstances Roxy? have been. Roxy? Yeah, I mean. Or Curly? I think Curly. I knew Curly before I met her. And uh, it was, uh, what, 2007 when I, yeah, 2007, 2007, I uh, got to meet her on a shark dive and, uh, you know, became fascinated with her because our passions were so much similar, you know, wanting to help sharks and she was just kind of a budding marine biologist at that time and I wanted to help her document her research and, uh, you know, I'm pursuing her on a, on, you know, a non-professional level, I wanted to get a date with her and uh, she said, well, if we get a, a tiger shark on this dive, she's like, I'm, not, I'm too busy to be involved in a relationship, you know? And, uh, <laughs> I would like, say school full-time and four And she, she yeah. just threw it out there on the table, but they're gonna throw it out there in nature and to luck, you know, like, it, it, we, it's she not tiger so shark perfect. season. You, uh, and so she's she, like, she, and I hadn't seen she a tiger She said, if you anymore. get a tiger, I'll go out on a date with you? Yeah, yeah, and we went on this dive, and it wasn't tiger shark season, so I was like, what the, it's not gonna happen, there's no way, and then, but lo and behold, Curly Girl is a girl that I, I'd been diving with for like probably two or three years prior where we see her every year annually, but this was in May and she doesn't usually show up until August. And she came out of the blue in, in May. So it was like, it was like destiny. I was like, yes, yeah, I get she to go to the She's such a yeah. cool tiger. But why is she called Thank Curly you. Girl? So she has a curled dorsal. Okay. It curls over like this. It's okay. a very distinct marking for her. And we went a period maybe like four years without seeing her. So it was like, oh, we lost her. Like someone killed her. and. And then she came back four years later, and, uh, and we see her annually, almost every year around August through October, at least once, once or twice. And, and tiger sharks yeah. here in Hawaii, do they, do, what's their migration patterns? Do they, um, do they we resonate? We do have or? tiger sharks that stay around the main Hawaiian Islands year-round. Yeah. Um, for a lot of the females, a lot of them will go up to the northwest Hawaiian Islands. And then usually around October, a couple months before, a couple months after, a lot of them will come down, potentially for pupping. So it's, there's still so much that we don't know about them. And again, it's so sad that they're being wiped out faster than we can actually study them. Yeah. But Curly Girl is a really special individual for us, like as a couple, um, but even just doing normal dives out there and I'm kind of getting like this pack type behavior from 
sandbars and Galapagos sharks and she comes by and what happens when a tiger shark comes by, especially a more dominant individual, is it'll calm the other sharks down and they'll actually drop. They kind of give way really? in that social oh. hierarchy because there's a social hierarchy within a species and across species. And so she's come by and helped me out a couple of times and it's kind of funny like fighting with him every now and then, a couple do, right? Yeah. And then she shows up the next day like, you guys are good kind of things. <laughs> she's <laughs> she's, she's, yeah, she's kind of like amazing. the old grandma shark mm. now and she's really like changed a lot of people's minds and perceptions, understanding um, and appreciation, I think, of sharks. Just coming by and showing what a tiger shark's really like, because that sounds like a scary thing, and a lot of people would think, like, no, I don't want to see a tiger shark. Like, maybe a sandbar, maybe a Galapagos, but not a tiger shark. I'm like, they'll end up being one of your favorite species. They really are incredible, but again, it's like, it's an apex predator, it's a wild animal. It's just like, if you were gonna go interact with a human that you don't know, right? You wanna give them that respect in their space and kind of build that up. But that is the nice thing about studying them and spending so much time in the water with them is getting to know them as individuals yeah. and building up those trust levels um, so that you can have these like incredible kind of intimate interactions where they'll actually swim by you and be like, can you scratch me right there? Yeah, some of the pregnant <laughs> girls, uh, the, the, we call them the BGs, you know, like Curly, she'll, every couple of years she'll be pregnant coming by and you can see the skin super stretched and she'll be wanting to rub up on the side of the boat or come up for actual touch which is like incredible with like no food or anything like she's just coming straight up to you and like and you have to kind of gently push her off but she almost likes the scratching I mean and it's, it's pretty I can, amazing. I can it, ask a question you may not have an answer to but do they have do you think they have an emotional life? Mm. Um, I've definitely seen frustration and yeah. I think frustration stems from confusion uh -huh. and that can lead to physical aggression so that's something that like we're very very sensitive to because we have seen it when confusion or frustration does lead to physical aggression we've seen that between species and between individuals and that's something that we study specifically so that we know kind of when to back off and what kinds of threat displays or behaviors to look out for so that we right. know when to remove ourselves from the equation now sometimes being in the field of study that we are and wanting to better know and understand we'll stay in the water when we are seeing a lot of competitive behavior um, as researchers just to study that and invariably as they move up their social hierarchy and they knock out other dominant individuals eventually that attention might get turned towards you so occasionally yeah we do get rushed by a shark because we're in their space right yeah. and so we've learned to adapt to that and even respond to that and so we can teach people if they're on their own and they're out in the Maldives or Tahiti or Hawaii and a tiger shark swims up to them what to do what not to do to avoid an adverse interaction and then if the shark is maybe in a compromised position meaning that it's on the brink of starvation how you could respond to the approach from a tiger shark. And you have to keep in mind too, it's, it doesn't matter if you're a dog, a tiger shark, a cat, or a human, if you're on the brink of starvation, you might be willing to break your natural diet, right? If I set you on a boat with a couple people and sent you out to sea for a few months, invariably you'd probably eat some of those other people. So right. you have to think these animals and their ecosystems um, with fish stock populations declining and all their natural resources being taken by humans at the rate that they are, Right? They have to find other food sources potentially. Have you studied or do you know of any work that actually shows that sharks are are undernourished because we've taken too much of their prey out of the water? Or I mean I agree with you. I'm not disagreeing, but I'm 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 trying to find out if there's if there's evidence out there for this yet or if it's something we've that we need to document. Definitely studied a lot of very thin emaciated sharks where you can actually see the, the upper thoracic body cavity is started to sunk and cave in. Uh -huh. We've even studied blind sharks. And this is really interesting, studying um, the importance of eyesight for sharks. Because you'll have a Galapagos shark that will be the darkest shade of gray. Tell us what a Galapagos shark looks like. So a Galapagos <clears throat> shark is um, between 6 to 12 feet in length. It has a large thoracic body cavity, more rounded snout, um, kind of that classical shape that a lot of people think of a bull shark looking like. Um, they're more of a bronzy type color with little black trailing edges. And so what happens is if they're spending a lot of time in the very, very surface layers or a lot of time down at depth, yeah. they'll start to actually change colors. Their skin pigmentation, they can actually tan. And so we've seen a number of blind sharks who are emaciated and they change colors and they start to bump into things. How do you know they're blind? You can see their eyes. 
Their, so you can see their eyes. pupils. They're it's, fogged over. Yeah. yeah, completely yeah. fogged over, and they'll actually. And their behavior. It's, yeah. yeah, it's just like a blind person kind of feeling around. Why do they go blind? Um, well, we have one individual we call Hook because he's yeah. got a hook through his dorsal fin, and so perhaps when he was caught and he was struggling to get off Knocked the line, his eyes. could have damaged his eyes. Yeah. yeah. So we don't know exactly why, but he yeah. does have a hook and. Um, you, you guys are amazing. I love you guys. Yeah, you know, you know my, I've devoted my life to the ocean, and, and you're, you're representing the ocean passionately, informatively. And, and I read Ocean that you're a very accomplished free diver. You said you can hold your breath for six and a half minutes. Is that mm -hmm. right? Tell me how you can hold your breath. So for I six use minutes. free diving as a tool for studying sharks yeah. and marine animals because yeah. when you can hold your breath and go down, you're more like a natural marine animal. Right. Um, it's also called the mammalian diving reflex. So it's something that we share in common with other marine, well, marine animals. Right. Um, but yeah. That's uh, a long time. Static, static breath hold six and a half minutes. That means that you're underwater but not moving for six and a half minutes. So the more that I move, the shorter my breath hold is. And that's because when your muscles are moving, they're, they're burning oxygen, they're using right. oxygen. So if you can drop your heart rate and oxygenate your tissues and build up your tolerance to low levels of oxygen, which are, that's actually what tells your body you need to breathe, and high levels of CO2. Um, sorry, that's what actually tells your body that you need to breathe. Right. Low levels of oxygen is what causes you to black out, but you basically do all this hypoxic training, right. and then you just kind of slow your movements down, and then you can stay underwater for a long period of time. And anybody can do this with training. And I would actually advise it, because it helps you to calm yourself in um, maybe stressful situations, or if you have an injury, you can drop your heart rate. Um, How deep have you dived on a breath hold? 200 feet. Wow. It, and that's her not maxing out either. Is yeah. that with she weights? touched the sand. Is that with weights? Or <laughs> um, a little bit of weight on my weight belt, fins and a mask. And so I you're actually down. kicking down to 200 yeah. feet? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's but on the a records are and I'm the records are a lot. lot oh, I know, I know the records, yeah. but they use sleds and stuff like that for the records. Um, oh. Even without fins, yeah. it's yeah. actually deeper. I, yeah. I mean, it's pretty crazy. It's amazing. Have you seen the movie The Big Blue? Yeah, I love that yeah, movie. Yeah, that's one, that's really one of my cute. favorite movies. It has like yeah. a little cheesy yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's cute. It's, it's based on Jacques Maillard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although I, I, heard an I heard an interview that he gave some time after the movie came out, and somebody said, so what did you think of the movie? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'd probably try to kill myself too if I had a girlfriend like that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was a joke. That's it was terrible. a joke by him. But, but, yeah. but I like that they freed the dolphin in that. Yeah, yeah. That was like yeah. the best yeah. part. Yeah. 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 I love that movie. I love I love any movie that has to do with with the ocean, especially you know diving diving movies. What are some of your favorite like ocean movies? What are your any of the BBC stuff? Yeah, no, I'm not really documentaries. Really I'm really thinking of the Hollywood stuff. The Hollywood movie. stuff. Gosh, it's funny because it's like honestly we haven't had a TV in like over no. ten years, I don't know if and like we're I like always the, outside. I like the and abyss. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. The abyss yeah. is a yeah. good one. Yeah. yeah, the Big Blue mm. is probably one of my favorites. Yeah, those are gonna be the same um, Actually, like I, I'm quite a fan of Jaws. Uh, I, I think I, for some people, I, it inspired them to yeah. take an interest in. And full church. disclosure, Peter Benchley was my best friend, uh, the mm -hmm. author of the mm -hmm. book, and the movie. And uh, but then he, he did everything he, to try he, and reverse. Yeah. Yeah, with, yeah, with me. With you. Yeah, yeah was, he did too. Yeah, yeah. He and I were. Uh, we shared a mentor, uh, a man that I always like to mention, Teddy Tucker from Bermuda, who uh, took us both under his wing. We were quite young. And I went off and became a marine biologist, and he went off and did the Jaws stuff and became famous and rich mm -hmm. and all that. And uh, we, we remained friends and close friends and dive buddies. And then kind of at the peak of it all, he came back to me and he said, Greg, I'm so sick of this. He said, what, what can I do to be more like educational about the, about the ocean and sharks? So I said, well, Pete, I, I think that with your name and your reputation, you probably do some advocacy work and some Movie. So he and I made a series of marine conservation films back in the 1990s, and uh, Peter got very active in China, trying to reverse the uh, the Dragon shark finning uh, that happened. And uh, you know, I he, think that's he, huge that he like mm -hmm. did that with yeah. you because I mean I wish I could get Spielberg to come yeah, out and die. Yeah, any connections to Spielberg <laughs> that we can like tap into. And uh, Peter always pointed out that when you go to the bookstore to buy Jaws, you go to the fiction section of the bookstore. Yeah, <laughs> and, but a lot of people and, don't know and, that. And a lot of yeah. the uh, <coughs> criticisms he got about it, uh, it you know, it kind of it weighed on him a little bit because he never, he never wanted it to be a demonization of sharks. 
and he also pointed out that he never created the fear of sharks. He stimulated it. He admitted mm -hmm. that through it's, the book, um, but the fear, you know, had been there. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, um, and that <clears> comes from the fear and phobia that people naturally have instinctually to survive of the unknown. And yeah. so at the time when Jaws came out, mm, there's not a whole bunch of shark science out there. There's not yeah. a bunch of people like, I mean, this is before our time. Um, mm. There's not a lot of people out there like going swimming with white sharks or tiger yeah. sharks, you know, and just being like, come here, well, I'll rub well, your nose. Well, it's interesting, <laughs> in my generation, which is one, one off of yours, a whole group of us were inspired to be Matt Hooper. Because mm -hmm. that, yeah, that was, that was the first time an oceanographer yeah. had been portrayed on the screen. Mm -hmm. You've got to go back to 1975. <laughs> Their oceanography was only about 10 years old as, as a discipline. And suddenly there was this guy who studied the ocean. And he had a beard. He wore blue <laughs> jeans. <laughs> he, he, he was oh, kind of but. funny. He liked to drink. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, and and it, it was this character that was like uh, kind of appealing. And a lot, of, a lot of oceanographers my age were sort of inspired by Matt Hooper, as are several uh, underwater photographers I know, Brian Scarry being one, a good friend of mine. What do we do? You know, yeah, I think that's you, a the, great two, question. the two of you existing is, is a huge thing, and I can see it in your eyes, I can hear it in your stories, and I welcome you, and I, I personally put out my offer to help you in any way that I can, because we need to... We need to get this message out. Change we, the tide before it's we, too late. We need to change that. We, we need to communicate. You, know, you, you can write mm -hmm. all the science papers in the world. But nobody but reads them unless you're another scientist. You already know better. And that's mm -hmm. where I find that like teaming up with people um, and showing imagery, right? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, I mean... Imagery that people are going to watch. Captivating, that, yeah. right? And that's why I, I sort of, I'm returning back to Hollywood now. Because yeah. even though Hollywood is Hollywood, people actually watch those movies. Yeah, now, and they like them. How do you build into the it's wear all the time? It's starting now, and that's what it is. It's literally social media, and yeah. you know, it's like posting on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or Flickr or Tumblr or whatever it is, um, and, and just getting more and more and more people to help spread that awareness to overcome this this gross misperception and the way that they've been portrayed for generations. And all of a sudden, these upcoming generations will go in and we'll talk to kids and, and they're fascinated about science, but the difference is they're growing up with iPads and instant internet access where they can read these research papers and articles and they could see these images of a person swimming next to a great white and then all of a sudden it's like, wait, how is that possible? Wait, I thought that they eat people, right? No, maybe they don't. And actually, I thought it was great. You're like, what can we do? Besides just media, it's our conscious consumer choices. And so as you travel around the world, helping spread awareness, but also realizing that you kind of vote with your dollar. And so if you're buying a fish at a restaurant, you know, to eat, um, that one fish, if it was caught in a long line fishery, it might've cost the lives of nine other animals. So being a conscious consumer and actually even knowing what you're eating, because if you read a menu and it says white fish, well, what kind of white fish is it? Is it Moki or is it Flake? Those are all names that sharks are known by. And as he said, they're really high in toxins and mercury. It's bad for your health. It's bad for That's the environment. That's a good angle. Health. Human health yes. is a great angle. Yeah, if you don't care about the environment, you should care about yourself, right? Yep. Yeah, so, and yeah. even your pets. And so they'll, they'll mislabel shark and they'll put it into pet food. And again, high in toxins and mercury. And um, not to put you like on the spot kind of thing, but it's... Uh, we actually sometimes will wear this shirt and it says plastic is the real killer. And it's not sharks that are killing humans, but yeah. it's actually those toxins that come down from these breakdown of plastics. And these are a lot of the commonplace plastics that you see in the ocean. And they don't just kill sharks, they kill dolphins, turtles, whales, and ultimately humans as well. So you got sunglasses, sports, bags, yep. and plastic water bottles. Yeah. And, and so straws. these bottle caps, yeah. I have to say, because I've traveled everywhere in the world except for Antarctica <laughs> but every place that I've gone as a kid growing up and traveling I didn't see plastic right I saw a lot of fish I saw a lot of sharks and now I go to these places and I see more plastic than I do fish and sharks and every single beautiful beach out here we run reef and beach cleanups the second Saturday of every month and every time we go to the beach we pick it up we see plastic water bottle caps and plastic bags and straws, like a single use plastic item. I think that's a huge thing. So when you ask, how can we help and how can we get involved? It's not just about saving sharks. It's about 
wildlife in general, and it's being a conscious consumer. What's the name of your organization, and what are your plans? Tell me what you're, what's, what's ahead for you in the near future. The name of our organization is One Ocean Diving, yep. and we also have a nonprofit uh, that's called Water Inspired. But the uh, One Ocean Diving kind of focuses more about uh, taking six individuals out, getting them a direct experience with sharks, and, and they're led through this whole experience by a marine biologist like Ocean. It gives them information of like what she was talking about, body language, and how we can dive with them safely. And on the way back in, the favorite part of the whole thing is just going through the conservation aspect with the people and letting them know that, hey, 100 million of these animals are killed every year, and it's an unsustainable rate. In the last 30 years, we've wiped out 95 to 90 percent of the populations. That are, so we're like down to like 5 percent. So it's yeah. like crunch time. Yeah. And and, and then they're shocked getting that information and they just had this amazing experience and so they, they're like, what can we do? And they educate them about being a conscious consumer, but also being the voice for these animals because, I mean, at the end of the day, the fear that's out there with them is really what's stopping people from caring about them to be able to do anything to protect them. Yeah. So, you know, sharing their experience, it's not something they read in a book or saw on TV, they actually did it. These people become like, Totally and 100 percent. They want to help these animals out because they know how amazing they are and that they don't see people as a food source. And we do kind of feel like if you can get people to care about sharks, and, and it's pretty easy, honestly, when you meet them. They're so amazing. It can be actually one of the most relaxing things like you'll maybe do in your life, which sounds weird. But then suddenly they can care more about the marine ecosystem in whole. And that's where, you know, it comes down to the conscious consumer choices. And like when you go to the beach, do you pick it up and leave it a little bit more beautiful or you know when you go out shopping or you're going traveling or if you're voting or you know what are you doing like in your life and that's kind of the fun thing of like you know just putting reusable bags in your your car when you go to the grocery store it's a simple little thing but you'd be surprised how much it can actually impact and for those of us that grew up with a dive mask you know it's like we get to see that impact right yep. when we go diving the ocean is not the same as when you we're younger, right? And going exploring these remote places. Mm -hmm. Now you go back and the coral's dead and there's plastic and there's fishing line. And it sounds dismal, but I don't think it is. And that's actually why we, um, we named the nonprofit Water Inspired, because we think that you know inspiration and hope um, is, is a far greater way of reaching people. Yeah, yeah. you gotta have a positive message. You gotta give people somewhere to go. Uh, well, it can be fun yeah. and exciting yeah. too. And that's the mm -hmm. thing about going out with the sharks or going anywhere, go dive with sperm whales or whatever it is. It's just like, it's fun, it's exciting. There's something worth saving there and it can be a really easy way to get involved in conservation. But yeah, we need everybody in it. It's not just scientists, you know, it's not just photographers and videographers. It's, it's people who are artists who are donating their art or students who are helping out on projects or divers who are cleaning up the beach it's like literally anyone can get involved and make the effort so it's not leaving it to somebody else but it's actually it's a collaborative effort it's a community effort because you can change laws but if you don't have community buy-in if people don't see the value of an animal of a shark or whatever regulation they're not ultimately going to follow it and so i think it's actually more important to reach people and especially these upcoming generations and they're in with it because of social media and things like that and they have the access and they want to get out there and when they experience it they're not traumatized by jaws so that helps too. Yeah. <laughs> outside of sharks because i know you, you love sharks and you're absolutely crazy passionate about that and and I know from your passion that you are going to succeed because that's what it takes is the kind of passion you've got. What's your favorite marine animal outside of a shark? I think orca. I mean, I have so many. Orca. Honestly, okay. like, orca. That's good. orca or sperm whale. Orca or sperm whale. What about you, Juan? Ooh, sperm whale. Yeah, okay. biggest They're predator really on the planet. They're really interesting. And I just had one brief encounter with one, and uh, I definitely I need more before I pass. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well. Can I can I ask you to come back again? Yeah, uh, on this of show because we're gonna come back and do a whole series about Hawaii. Okay, but only and if you come diving with us tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll definitely <laughs> come be diving yeah. with you tomorrow. I can't. I really can't wait. And yeah. I, uh, yeah, again, thank you. You've inspired me, and I and I feel like uh, uh, you're just the kind of people the world needs right now. So please, please keep going, and uh, I will definitely you know promote what you're doing in, in the communication networks that we have. And if there's anything I can do. You know, please let me know. So, thank you very awesome. much. Thank no, you. You're, you're uh, getting the uh, conservation out there on the <laughs> media platform, which yeah. is what yeah. needs it's to happen. Every yeah. every effort can make a difference. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you yeah, for yeah. putting this together. You bet. Oh, totally. yeah. Thanks, listeners, yeah. and we'll see you next week.